Good afternoon, everybody. This is Patrick from the Poison Pen Bookstore, and we're here with another of our virtual events this afternoon. And today we have Mark Sullivan. Um, he's going to be discussing his brand new book, The Last Green Valley. And um, of course, there's a copy of the Beneath a Scarlet Sky, big breakout book for Mark. Barbara will be talking about that too, I'm sure. And uh, for those of you watching on Facebook, uh, I'm going to be monitoring the Facebook comments. So please, if you have questions for Mark, don't, don't be shy. Put them in the comments field and I'll emerge uh, about a half hour, 40 minutes in to, to ask some of your questions. So in the meantime, Barbara, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Patrick. I'm going to hold up the book in one hand. Yay, my reading copy. And I'm going to hold up my glass of wine to salute Mark because this is indeed his book launch. Congratulations, Mark. Thanks so much, Barbara. It is a Appreciate pleasure. Hmm. Delicious. I couldn't find a Ukrainian wine and I didn't really want to do German, so it's French. <laughs> but still, I'm kind of in the picture. So I would like to say that Mark, Mark has been an author whose books I have admired, his 20-some books that I have admired for a really long time. He wrote some great thrillers. He's written some books with James Patterson, which were exciting. And he wrote three books that I truly loved about a character named Robin Monarch. And while I didn't look and Mark didn't look to see if they were still in print, I'm pretty sure they were still in ebooks. So Mark, before we launch into this wonderful story, remind me about Robin Monarch, because I just loved him. Yeah, Monarch is a thief. He is a, we grew up on the streets of Buenos Aires. He lived in a street gang, became very proficient at things like being a pickpocket and gradually grew up to become a master thief. And he's a master thief for a while for the United States of America. And then he goes rogue. He does. I, I was reminding Mark, I planned an entire trip to Switzerland on trains around one of the Robin Monarch books when he starts out scaling the walls in and out. I can't remember of a hotel in St. Moritz. And to my fury, when I got to St. Moritz, the whole month of October, the month I was there, the damned hotel was closed. It's closed. <laughs> I know. Every year I was so yeah. cross because I think that Mark does a fabulous job with his um, evoking the place, whether he's actually been there or not been there. And in Beneath the Scarlet Sky, which was a very different book that many of you may have read, he did a lot of on the ground and personal research. And that is also true of this wonderful book, The Last Green Valley. So, Mark, you wrote really well in the, um, and quite movingly in your preface about how hard it was to find another story that was going to be, I don't want to say worthy of, but was going to be as, it was going to grab you as much in the telling as Beneath the Scarlet Sky. And, you know, I, we had a really interesting event with Dennis Lehane and Gillian Flynn at the end of March. And one of the things we talked about was how hard it is to follow a mega seller with another book, because not only are fans' expectations different, but probably your own are. So is that what happened to you? Which, which was more important, your own expectations or the fact that fans would expect something? Uh, well, both. You know, I write the books for both, for myself and for my readers. So um a lot of people said I would never find another story like it. And I really thought I would. And, and sure enough, I started getting all these ideas sent to me uh, by email and my uh, website. And then uh, I got to be so many of them, I had to start saying, okay, I need a filter of some kind. And I went back and I thought about Beneath the Scarlet Sky and why it, it touched so many people. And it really was because it was moving, healing, inspiring and transformative to me and to a lot of readers. And those four words became my filter. That was what I was looking for, a story that inherently had that. And I didn't get it until the fall of 2017 when I was doing a talk about Beneath the Scarlet Sky. And uh, right afterwards, I, I was at the Noontime Rotary in Bozeman, Montana. And right afterwards, a, a retired dentist comes up and says, do you know uh, this family in town, the Martells? And I said, like the construction people? Because there's a big construction company here. And he said, uh, yeah. 
He said, the entire time I was reading Beneath the Scarlet Sky, all I could think of was the story of how the Martells came to America and how brutal and crazy and ultimately life affirming this story is. And so now I'm intrigued. And a couple of days later, I put Bill Martell's name into my address into the navigator. And it's like two miles from my house, right? And uh, I follow and it tells me to take a left into this older neighborhood. And I get into the neighborhood and I've got this bizarre feeling and I can't quite figure out why. And then I get to Bill Martell's driveway and I step out and it hits me. I can't be 200, 250 yards from where I heard the story of Pino Lella, which became the novel Beneath the Scarlet Sky. So I knock on the door and I meet this great guy, Bill Martell, and we hit it off pretty fast. And he starts telling me the story of how it's a story of these refugees in a horse-drawn, covered wagon trying to outrun the Soviet Red Army while under the protection of Nazi SS officers who participated in the Holocaust. And I'm like, you know, say what? And, and, he's, and he just starts embellishing it and bringing it and developing it. And within an hour, it's got all the dimensions I'm looking for. It's another untold story of World War II about something that happened. This was called the Great Trek. It was 120,000 people ran from the Soviets under the protection of the Nazi SS. And it turns out under orders from Heinrich Himmler, the architect of the final solution. You know, it's so ironic. I mean, when you think about it, you chased all over looking for the story. It was right there in your doorstep. Astonishing. And there's a book that came out earlier this year called The Paris Library by Janet Skelsley and Charles. And astonishingly, the refugees from Paris or the refugee from Paris ended up in Montana. So I don't know what it is about the magic of Montana that draws people in. But so before I talk to Mark, I just wanted to point out one more thing. We do have autographed copies. This book is our notable new fiction book for May. So we don't have many unclaimed autographed copies, but we have some which should arrive any minute. But I wanted to show you, and this is a real shout out to Lake Union, the publisher. This is the book without the dust jacket. Look how beautiful it is where they have actually put the picture on the boards of the book. I don't often think about taking off the dust jacket to look at the cover inside because mostly it's just boring, but they are gorgeous. But the other thing that's really cool, which has driven me crazy, um, is the map. That's the end papers. Because in fact, what happens is there are three journeys that this family makes before they ever leave Europe. And they are plotted out on this map. And you really have to work at it to figure out which group is going where and why. And in fact, you really have to read the whole book for the map to make sense. But I'm so glad you put it in because I do think, Mark, in books like this, being able to actually trace it physically, right. you know, on a map is essential. Was that your idea? Uh, yes, it was my idea. And that was because uh, so many people asked for a map uh, with Beneath a Scarlet Sky. And I finally ended up putting something of a map on my website. Um, but it would have been better. I love. I've always loved books with uh, end papers, yeah. and it, they did a beautiful job constructing it. And um, it was obviously done with a lot of love and care. Yes, it really is. Now, amazingly, you may be surprised to hear this. I have actually been to most of the places in this book. Um, not as far as Kiev and East uh, Poltava, but I have been all through Romania, part of Ukraine, certainly yeah. Bulgaria. I've done the whole Danube, you know, up through Budapest and to Vienna and so forth, and Germany, thanks to the Frankfurt Book Fair. So it was really interesting for me to read this book and think about how these places are now as compared to how they were then. And I remembered my first trip to Europe, I was only 15 years old. And since I was born in 1940, it was 1955, and much of Europe was still just a wreck. Um, you know, um, and it was, it was really... This is the Europe that they, well, is in even worse shape when they're doing these travels. But we don't realize if we're tourists today just how devastating the war was and how many cities and how many places were truly destroyed and had to be rebuilt. 
and how many families as well. So Mark, one of the things I learned is, and this may surprise people, that in the Ukraine and certainly in Romania, I think also in Bulgaria, but definitely in Romania, there were loads of ethnic Germans that were lured to live in those countries um, as agriculturalists. And right. that's really what the Martel family is. They're not Russian, they're not Ukrainian, they're actually German, but they live in the Ukraine and they have been farming in the Ukraine for how long was it, Mark? More than a century. So they were offered land and uh, a tax-free status for 30 years if they would leave Germany and come to Ukraine at the behest of Catherine the Great, who offered them, again, land and no taxes. And they formed these colonies all over um, Eastern Europe and into Russia. And uh, they were just really good at bringing in big harvests. So the Martels, their families, their ancestors have been there for well over 120 years when the Bolshevik Revolution happens. And during those 120 years, they live very well, right? Because they're good at growing. They have a, a great life. Um, they speak German. They speak Russian. Uh, they are, by the time this book opens, well, wholly separated from Germany because they lived in these island like colonies. And when the <clears throat> what happened when they when the Bolsheviks took over, they got thrown off their land. They were tried to starve to death. Some of them were sent to, some of the Martels were sent to gulags, uh, never heard from. Some of them were sent to gulags and returned broken people. And, um, but they were basically, their entire life was trying not to get noticed under communism because they equated being noticed with having any kind of ambition and ambition got you sent to a gulag, right? So, um, by the time uh, 1941 rolls around, they're still in pretty desperate straits, even though they've got two kids, et cetera, and they're living in a, a city and all of a sudden Hitler invades. And when he invades, the first thing that happens, one of the first things that happens is they ask the ethnic Germans, you want your land back? And they say, yeah, we want our land back. So they go back and they start growing and they're there for like 18 months and then Stalin counterattacks. And right at the beginning of the book, the Martels are faced with this terrible decision. Do they stay and take their chances with the Soviet bear? Or do they run with the wolves, the Nazis they've grown to despise, but who have vowed to protect them? And they decide to run with the wolves because they figure if they can get as far west as they can go, they'll eventually get to a situation where they'll be able to get to a free country. Right. So they're actually not that far over the border into the Ukraine. They're relatively close to Romania. And, you know, right. one of the things that I think is so important about this book is that virtually all World War II stories, other than those set in the Asian theater, are Nazi centered. And yet this book reminds us of just how brutal the Soviets were. Actually, Stalin was far more, well, in many, I don't want to say far more brutal. He was easily as brutal as Hitler. And his policies, he probably actually killed more people, didn't he? 20 in million. His own country. 20 million people in his own yeah. country. And, and he, he starved 4 million Ukrainians to death in the winter of 31, 32, yeah. um, trying He's, to break their spirit. And he, he, he broke most of their spirits. Um, so yeah, and, and it's, it's an interesting thing about the, the Martel's decision. There's, there's not a good one right? No. There's no good decision at all. No, they're caught in a pincer between the advancing Soviet army and, yeah. and the Nazis. And, you know, I can, under, I wanted to emphasize the fact they were ethnic German, not yes. Russian. And right. that probably helped inform their decision, you know, to run. They ran west, essentially, because the Soviets were rolling in from the east, whereas, yes. you know, that, that seems on the surface of it, if all you think about is Hitler, like nuts. But in point of fact, Stalin and the Red Army was going to be just as horrible for them as, as going um, west of Germany. So we have Emil, who's the father, and Adeline, yes. the mother. And they right. have two sons, uh, Waldemar and what's the name of the other boy? Uh, Will, Wilhelm. Wilhelm, right. They call, right. They call him Will and Walt. Yeah, eventually their names, Waldemar and 
Willem become anglicized when they finally, at the end of the story, but Correct. for the book they are. But there's also Emil's parents, his mother, who Carolina, who's not a particularly wonderful, warm person. Um, so there's more of the family than just the Martell two parents and, and the two boys. And, right. you know, it's, it's sort of hard to imagine because we're, we're not even a century out. And basically, they're, they're going to run away in a wooden wagon drawn by horses. We're not right. talking mechanized, you know, we're not talking about people leaping into a Jeep or a truck or a car and driving west. We're talking about people going like the Conestoga wagons, essentially, traveling west. Exactly. It's really a kind of an interesting parallel, isn't that, too? Yeah. You know, with 120,000 people, uh, these ethnic Germans in big lines, they weren't all in one single line. They went different routes trying to just get as far west as they could go, as fast as they could go. But at first, they go across Moldova, which is Romanian controlled, and then Romania itself. Um, and this takes months. Uh, you know, they're moving like caterpillars. And uh, at a certain point, the Soviets stop chasing them. And they're basically just, you know, being smart, something that Hitler didn't do. He didn't keep his supply lines constantly supplied. And Stalin wasn't going to make that mistake. So he pauses and they get, you know, they, they get out in front and now they're running. Uh, and eventually they get all the way to the other end and they have to leave the horses. And the, uh, this is traumatic for them because the horses have saved their life multiple times in the course of the story to that point. They, the poor Martells have been with bombardments. They've been caught in actual tank battles where they're there with their horse and buggy uh, caught in the middle of tank battles and trying to survive. Uh, it, it's a simply remarkable story. And at the same time, they're also forced to reckon with their own actions and thought processes at the beginning of the Holocaust. This was something I didn't understand when I started researching the book that the actual final solution part of the Holocaust really begins in uh, Russia and a lot of it in Ukraine. Because right behind the Wehrmacht when they invade in 41, right behind them comes the Einsatzgruppen. And these guys were supposed to implement the Holocaust of bullets, which was to start executing Jews with guns. And um, so they weren't using gas chambers. They weren't doing this at the beginning. They were using guns. And uh, some of the ethnic Germans who lived there participated actively in this Holocaust of bullets. And uh, that becomes a sub theme that uh, carries through the book on who did what and when and why. And it becomes very, very morally complex. And I hope, I've, I've heard from readers, and, and but this was my hope that readers would start asking themselves in incredibly difficult situations, what would I have done? Would I have had the courage to do this or would I have hidden this? And these kinds of questions, when they're in a novel of this scope, they become very powerful. They echo back and forth throughout the narrative. And uh, it's, it was an absolute fascinating scenes and probably the most challenging scenes I've ever had to write were those uh, that took place during the Holocaust of bullets. Oh, you're absolutely right. And, you know, email, Emil, rather, as the father of the family, maybe gets to make a lot of them, but they're separated. The, the thing about the map that's interesting is there are three separate journeys because they start out in the Ukraine fleeing west, as Mark has been describing. But there's a point at which they are broken up as a family, and Emil goes off on his own journey, which actually takes him way back further east into Russia, east of right. Kiev. And Adeline and the children end up going in a different direction into Germany and these people ever going to find each other again. I know. And it, it's, it's, it, it's right when they're preparing to make the final run because Emil's dream is to get to the allied, the Western allied lines and, you know, surrender. And he said, it would be better to be their refugees than Stalin's refugees. And, they're just about to make that run, that final run for the Allied lines, and he gets grabbed 
by Polish militiamen who turn him over to the Soviets. And he gets sent to a prison camp. And as he's dragged away, um, Adeline's like having a you know nervous breakdown because she saw her own father drug away very similarly. She never saw him again. He never returned. And she, he, she said, what do I do? And he screams, go west, go as far west as you can and I'll find you. I promise I'll find you. And uh, he disappears. And so imagine this woman now is left with two children. And now they don't even have a wagon anymore. They've got a cart with all their belongings on it. And they literally start pushing this cart through the aftermath of the war. So one of the things that really fascinated me about the whole thing was I had never read about people just trying to get out of the way of World War II. And it turns out 60 million people were displaced by World War II. 60 million people were just trying to get out of the way. As I said, this I haven't read before, and I want to write about this. And the scenes where she's walking, pushing um, the cart with uh, her mother and her sister and her two boys and her cousin and her twins, um, and each of them pushing a cart, this is 20 million people moving at once because after the war, all the um, Eastern European countries and most of the other European countries expulsed all Germans, ethnic Germans or active living in Germany. They were told to go back to Germany. So they, you know, there were no cars or whatever. People walked, you know, if you can imagine this. And they walked into a country that had been destroyed by the Allies and by the fighting. Uh, and it was completely overtaxed and the whole thing was, you know, it was crazy. And you had to basically finally just find shelter and food. You know, fortunately, Adeline finds shelter and food on the wrong side of history. She's on the Soviet side. Well, she is. And of course, we have to remember that the Soviets managed to get into Eastern Germany and hive it off, including Berlin. There's always been speculation that if FDR hadn't been dying, uh, which he was in, you know, in the end of the war. And if Patton had been actually let loose and had could have gotten to Berlin first before the Soviets, it would have all been different. But such a, you know, the way it all turned out, um, he didn't, Patton did not. And the Soviets then, you know, established East Germany. There was the Berlin blockade. There was all that stuff. Sure. So even if you got sent back to Germany, you know, it wasn't Germany anymore. It was partitioned right. off and you had to get to the right part of Germany because if you got stuck in the East part, good luck, you know. Um, uh -huh. God, it was, it was awful. But, you know, it wasn't just Germany. I've read books, Mark, about, you know, people in France who had to walk, you know, they walked all the way yeah. um, across the, the Vichy line and, you know, down into the South of France. And so I say, you know, we're so mechanized today. I don't think we realize that, um, 80 years ago, people were still walking or, or horses. There was actually cavalry, I think, still in the early days of World War II, if I remember correctly. Before, you know, the tanks, yeah, before the tanks came in and so forth. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we've, we've moved so rapidly in transportation and communication that I don't think we realized that, you know, how different it was. And of course, they didn't have any way to keep in touch. They didn't have cell phones. They didn't have satellite phones. They didn't nothing. have internet. They had nothing. So no. when when a meal disappears, there's absolutely no guarantee that they'll ever find him again. No, there, there's no guarantee. And so a lot of what happens in the course of the book is a question of faith. Yeah. Emil, Emil begins the entire novel having lost his faith. And... Um, Adeline has strong faith all the way until that separation. And at that separation, she's on her own. She makes the decision to do exactly what Emil told her to do, to go as far west as she can. And she like literally walks for two weeks and gets to Berlin two weeks, you know, actually eight weeks post-war. And, you know, it's, it's a bombed out place. Uh, it was the scene of savage fighting, uh, I can't remember how many um, Soviet soldiers died fighting for Berlin, but it's stupefying. Uh, and she's seeing all this. And, but even by this point, 
it's been divided up into sectors, the Soviet sector, the British sector, the American sector, and I believe the French sector, and uh, which was the smallest. And um, so again, where you stopped walking or for whatever reason, and her reason was shelter and food, where you stopped walking was where you ended up as a refugee. And every day that passed, the borders between the two occupying forces hardened, you know, imperceptibly at first, but then harder and harder and harder and harder. Uh, so, oh, true. I've been out yeah. to Potsdam and, you know, it's really interesting. There's a bridge in Potsdam that shown up in a movie or two, but, you know, there's a Russian settlement. I mean, there's, it's, it's really, it was so balkanized to use that phrase. It's hard sure. to remember. Well, I mean, this isn't, this isn't a thriller in the classic sense, but every thriller actually needs a good villain. And you've adapted one German officer to be, if there is a villain in this book, you've adapted him as that villain. So where'd he come from? So Hausman was a real person. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the way this come, this backstory comes into play was, A, when I found out that the uh, many of the SS officers who protected the ethnic Germans in this actual historical event called the Long Trek, which the, it basically uh, forms the first half of the book, the Trek. And um, many of them have participated in the Holocaust. So many of the SS officers and uh, regular soldiers had been um, actively participating in shooting Jews. And I found that out and I was like, okay. And then I also found out that some of the ethnic Germans participated. And then I found out that some of them after the fact when there were actual war crimes trials in the Soviet Union and uh, in the West that, uh, that these people tried to claim that they never killed Jews, they just buried them. And I, and this is, as I'm doing the research, I get, um, I have a discussion with Adeline's granddaughter and she tells me that shortly after they returned to this tiny town of Friedenstahl, this colony, um, Emil had to go to a nearby town to get roofing supplies. And he's supposed to be gone like a day, a day and a half. And instead he's gone like four days. And when he comes back, Adeline tells her granddaughter that Emil is like absolutely rattled, shaken. And she asks, well, like, where have you been? What's happened? And he says, I was held by the Nazis and I was forced to bury Jews. And so I'm going, okay, now I got to deal with this, right? And um, I first thing I did is I went back to, you know, I went back to people I know and researched as the Yad Vashem and uh, I did my own research at the uh, U.S. Uh, Holocaust Museum in D.C., which is an excellent um, archival resource. And there's nothing about them. So, but I said, you know, this is something I've got to deal with because this was going on. And it turns out that the closest major town would have been this place, Dubasari. And it turns out that roughly about the same time that Mr. Martel went to that town for roofing supplies, the Einsatzgruppen was there and they killed 17,000 Jews. They murdered them in the ravines outside Dubasari. And um, so I realized I was going to have to deal with that in the book, even though Mr. Martel hardly talked about it at all. And um, it actually, because I figure as a novelist, you have two choices. You can ignore it or you can face it. And I'm wholly in fa favor of facing it because in my opinion, some of the most dramatic moments in the entire book are in that sequence of scenes that describe Dubasari. I agree with you, they're really wrenching. And no. you know, I don't wanna give away the whole book. This isn't a crime novel, but nonetheless, I think that we don't wanna commit spoilers here, but the ethical dilemmas that, um, that Mark talks about that people had to face and you come back to that question, you know, of, you know, if your life's on the line, what choices do you make, you right. know, for yourself, for your family? And, you know, he has a wife and two sons. And so he's not just responsible for himself, but, but for them, plus their yes. parents and other stuff. And, you know, I don't, I don't know that we can judge, you know, what we would do in a, in a situation like that. Um, right. Oh, and any of us do, you know. Um, but I thought you did. I thought you did an excellent job with it. In fact, one of the reasons that 
I think Beneath a Scarlet Sky did so well and why I expect this book to do so well. So many World War II stories end tragically. You know, yes. awful things happened and, yes. and people don't recover. Um, right. People die or people never reconnect or people make bad choices and so forth. And so right. even though the situation that the Martel family has to endure for however long it is, what is it, five, well, longer than that. Eventually, I'm happy to say, they do arrive at the last Green Valley, which as we hinted right. at the beginning of this conversation, is actually your Bozeman, Montana. Right. Um, and, you know, I, I think you're right that it's, it's great it's great to read that people can survive the most dreadful, horrendous testing circumstances and families can be riven and losses are great and so forth, but somehow or other, some people manage to get to a, uh, a good place in the end. And that happened yes. to a guy in Beneath the Scarlet Sky. The other thing that's interesting is that in all these stories, these people live forever. I mean, despite the fact that they went through a war and deprivation and, you know, they were starving and terrible things happened to them, they must have had fabulous genes. Well, not only that, if you look into it, people who are starved at a certain point in their life end up living longer. It's Don't true. Say it's that. Weird. No. no, 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 it's true. <laughs> it's true. It's, it's not, they don't die, but if yeah. they were deprived of food, there's something odd that happens ge genomically, but that's yeah. another story. Um, but yeah, you're right. It's, I am, you know, a story these days for me, it to attract, to be, for it to be attractive to me enough to spend two to three years of my life writing it yeah. and researching it, it's gotta be inherently moving, healing, inspiring, transformative, and, I think these kinds of stories, especially when they result in a triumph, yes. I think we're, I think people are hungry for these kinds of stories. And I know I am. These are the stories that I naturally gravitate to are stories of people who just overcame overwhelming odds and, and uh, obstacles and just never gave up. They held tight to a dream and they held tight to the dream by having faith, by relying on love, by basically making their family the most powerful thing that they could imagine. And these things, getting them all through, really one of the more remarkable uh, you know, journeys that I've ever heard of, just because of that split, mostly. Because when he goes to the prison camp, he's one man, and he's still suffering from what happened to Dubasari. And she goes and she's trying to survive. And the interesting thing I, I always found was that the brothers, Martell brothers, Will and uh, Walt, um, will tell you that before he went into that prison camp, Emil, Emil Martell was a very timid man. He was always trying not to get noticed, just to survive. That's all he needs. And something happens to him in that prison camp. He goes in with 2,300 men. Um, there's disease almost immediately. People start to die almost immediately. And he undergoes a metamorphosis while he is working on the death detail. And while we know this for a fact, because he told, I mean, in so many words, he told his wife and sons that the, the, the experience of being on the death detail and seeing this and being one of the, the last survivors, right built a different man and he exits and he, you know, he, he, he becomes a different per person. He sees opportunity and he escapes this prison camp. And he, he almost starts acting not like James Bond, but I mean, he's not the guy who goes in, right? He, in some ways he is, but he's really not. And he comes out and he makes this incredibly insane, improbable journey all the way back across Ukraine and and all the way into Poland and he gets to Germany he gets to the, to the British sector it's so improbable that he pulls it off and the way he pulls it off and that um, formation of character never leaves his life it's there for the rest of his life it's set and, and yeah. well but yeah. you know what what worse could happen to him maybe if you actually you know, plumb the the absolute worst that can happen to you, right? And you you don't die. Maybe 
you know, maybe you feel like it's a gift, you know, that you're on borrowed time and that you can't afford to waste it. And you can make the most of it because indeed in the end of the book, you do write about what a different person he is and, um, right. and how he was able to build not just a new life, but a remarkable um, new life. And of course, he was really hardened by the whole thing, too. I don't know what kind of physical specimen he was when it all started. I mean, he was, you know, it must have been relatively tough because farming was not easy. But by the time he's gone through all of this, you know, he's a really hardened physical and psychological specimen. And that allows him to do things that he might not have done. I, you know, because I was fascinated with Adeline's story because she's responsible for two kids. So, you know, he's responsible just for himself once they are separated and right. he's sent way back east into Russia. But she doesn't have the luxury of thinking just about herself. She has to worry about these two boys. I'm trying to remember, did she lose a child before all this? Yes. Stuff? Were there two Waldemars? There were, weren't there? Yes, yes. She lost a child um, because she was working as a field hand and she contracted malaria along the you know, aptly named Bug River. Um, there was malaria in the marshes and she contracted it while she was pregnant. She gave birth to a preemie um, and the baby died. Right, so she's already had the experience of losing a child and maybe right. that made her even more resolute in um, yeah. not wanting to lose either of the boys that she has. And, you know, these kids are, are not even teenagers when all this is going on. Um, so they are forged in um, in a very hard, wow. I mean, they're, they're really tough. So by the time as you work out, the entire family gets reunited and probably, and probably reunited and yes. sail off um, West, which was their dream. Isn't it interesting right. how it's always West? I keep thinking about Tolkien. You know, and the Lord of the Rings and all. I mean, when yeah. terrible things happen, everybody wants yeah. to like go west. Um, right. But anyway, they do go west, and um, and it was it's all those things the the people they were forged into that allow yes. them to create the life that you encounter there in Bozeman, Montana. Exactly, and uh, I want just to go back to Adeline for for just a second and. What an amazing uh, character and personality she had. Uh, she is, you know, when he gets out, she's on the wrong side. And so she has to make her own move. And again, she does it with two children yeah. and the wagon. <laughs> and, you know, she makes this in, insane run and shows like, you just have to ask yourself, would you have had that kind of courage as, as a mom? And, and risk your son's lives to try to get to your husband and freedom. You know, it's a real tribute to perseverance. Um, yeah. I mean, not just faith, but these are people who literally never give up. Um, nope. And some people have that and some people don't. You know, I've read, I've read books about, you know, airline crashes where everybody dies, but like four people or something. And, you know, the people who survive it, maybe even one person, they are just, they just don't get up, give up, you know, they right. somehow claw themselves out of the wreckage and, you know, claw their way through the snowbank or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. But, you know, a lot of people just fold and, and some people don't. And I don't know, you know, what it is that distinguishes one person from another, but the four of them, this family, uh, the Martels, not one of them folds. Not, not just the father, them. not just Adeline, the mother, but the kids too. You know, right. none of them fold right. in some way or right. other. That allows right. them to, you know, to go on. And, you know, was that true of your guy in Beneath the Scarlet Sky? Would you say that that tenacity and that unwillingness to give up was a characteristic of him too? Oh, 100%. Yeah. His resiliency is just extraordinary. And the same thing with the Martells. They... Every, you know, they really looked at it that it was almost like everything that they went through prepared them for the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. So they were always forced to stretch, to grow, to become hardened, strong people 
that were capable of surviving an ordeal like this. And it's amazing to me, and I still, when I think about it, how when, when I thought about the long journey they took, that that's exactly what happened. It was like this step led to this one and this one and this one. And it, even as crazy as him being sent all the way back, you know, it was, it was almost as if he wasn't prepared yet to be the person who could go west. You know, he, he had to go through the he had to go through the prison camp experience to become a different person. And, um, you know, he becomes a different person because he really begins to understand the power of a dream that a person can hold in their hearts and never give up chasing it. You know, I often marvel. Well, all the time, because right now. World War II stories are like a whole subgenre of, they are. you know, liter of historical fiction for sure, and thrillers as well. It is it is incredible to me how many still untold stories of World War II they are. I mean, talk about a global scale. There is not, as far as I can tell, there's just not an untouched place, an untouched community, and un you know, mm -hmm. whatever. And we keep right. finding these amazing stories, you know, I mean, Kristen, Kristen kind of hit it off to some degree with the Nightingale, although many yep. of them had been written. The earlier books, though, then we've talked about that you and I, but other authors and I have talked about it, you know, a lot of the post-war stories, like Alistair McLean, were basically military stories, you know, I mean, I love The Guns of Navarone, for example, I mean, great movie, great story. You know, and there's the great escape. And we all think about, you know, there were the guys and the kind, there's Steve McQueen and his motorcycle and on and on and on. But what we're finding, you know, as we move on decades is that it's not really the military stories and the men's stories. It's the, it's the stories of families, of women, of children, you know, yes. collaborators, survivors, all yes. over the world. Um, you know, the late Philip Kerr wrote some amazing books about, um, about the war Alan first has written. I mean, there, yeah. you know, there's espionage stories and there's military stories and there's romantic stories. And, you know, and recently there's just been an enormous number of stories all about women, you know, yeah. women serving um, as land girls or, you know, women running bookshops or because, you know, men were gone. So the women had to take over and do all kinds of stuff. And I keep thinking there can't be another original story about well, there just can't be. And then I, you know, here's your book, The Last Green Valley, which is, yep. you know, not like any other story that I have read about World War II. And I mean, it's almost like a gift that keeps giving to novelists, which is a horrible way to put it because it was a perfectly dreadful time. But, yep. you know, you can almost not run out of stories about personal bravery or personal treachery or, you know, whatever. Yeah. It, it, it's it's it is amazing to me that um that this story for example had never been told in in a way that um i would find meaningful so once i understood that i was on you know um unbroken ground as it were i, I recognized that that the the trek itself is was a dramatic thing um the reason behind the trek was a dramatic thing I don't want to give away everything, but Heinrich Himmler had a real reason for wanting these people protected. And, it, and the Martells had no idea when they go when they started on this trek. And um, that whole idea of, of secrecy being layered on and circling back to my antagonist, Hausman. Hausman was a real character. He he participated, uh, his theater participated in the massacre at Dupasari. No direct evidence they ever met, but they sure were in proximity to each other. And Hausman was one of the leaders of the um, the trek. He was one of the guys in charge. So that's how it. This is how that part of the book came to be. Uh, yeah. It's a truly know. remarkable book. Um, I, I, and it's also a book that you don't want to put down once you start it because while it's not written as a thriller, it actually behaves like a thriller when you read it, you know, you just don't right. want to put it down. So Mark, um, before Patrick pops in, you've now written two astonishing books about World War II. Do you feel like that that's all you're going to write now? Or do you think that you might go back to writing something like Robin Monarch or 
or are you just going to take a little time off because this was a long and exhausting project? No, I have another story. I'm already working on it. Really? Um, it's not a World War II story, but it is historical fiction. And um, it is about a 13-year-old boy and an 11-year-old girl who are who live in Uganda about 20 years ago, and they are kidnapped by a messianic warlord named Joseph Kony. And they are forced to become child soldiers. Um, they're part of this army of 25,000 children uh, that Kony ruled. And they're, they don't meet each other until about halfway during the ordeal. And they fall in love and the power of love enables them to survive another one of these. You can't fathom someone enduring or overcoming something like this, much less a child. And they do, and they endure, and they triumph. And it's just one of those stories. Again, I heard it at, at a you know over a, a over a beer with a guy who used to be the um, commander of SEAL Team Six. Told me the story, and I was like, "What?" You know? And he said, "Yeah." And so I'm going to Uganda in five weeks and um they're alive and uh i'm going to go hang out with them and revisit the whole thing and then write a novel based on it oh, interesting so they're now calling to you these kinds of stories so you yeah. too have undergone a transformation not just the martels and not just um your guy in beneath the scarlet sky but you as an author yeah. um amazing patrick let's summon you up and see if we have questions from the audience or you have your own questions well, a lot of people watching and um, not a whole lot of actual questions, but there, there are a couple of good ones and actually some comments. Um, James, uh, I won't say his last name. He says, uh, unimaginable to be caught between Nazi soldiers and the communist troops. Talk about no good options. Uh, my wife's grandmother was from Marburg, Slovenia and was Austrian Deutsch. Uh, following the war, she was considered a person without a country. She and her family were placed in a displaced persons camp run by the British in, I'm gonna blow this, Pfeffernitz, is that right? Or Pfeffernitz, Austria? Yeah. Austria. He just says, I've listened to many of her stories. Fascinating. Yeah, the, the Martells ended up in a displaced persons camp as well. Two of them before they were able to get um, permission to come to the United States. Wow. Okay, Dana has a question. Um, let's see, it is, uh, this is such an incredible story. Were there parts you wanted to include in the book but didn't make it in? And uh, how did you decide what parts to fictionalize? Um, you know, I couldn't, I, the, the, the trek itself is, is, you know, as it appears in the book is grinding, long, difficult in and of itself. I think it's the, the actual trek was more difficult than I depicted it. I, you know, I think that there were certain things that it was just Bill Martell will still describe, you know, scenes where he can remember being in the wagon and they were bumping over bodies because 20,000 people die on this journey. Um, there's like 130,000 who start 20,000 die. Um, so, uh, there was a point at which I had to make a decision as an author is how graphic is this going to go? And I tried to take it to, you know, this is horrific. This is brutal. This is what they went through, but I didn't want it to be overkill. Um, as I said earlier, that the scenes at Dubasari um, are based on a lot of research, but they are fictionalized because I, I wasn't able to ever interview Emil about it. I was able to listen to um, interviews with him, but they, they didn't talk about that, so. Um, let's see here. Angela asks, she, she asks, do you know if any of the Martell family ended up in Alberta? Um, that's a good question, I'll ask. I know a lot of ethnic Germans did end up in Alberta, uh, the big places for them to go uh, in the aftermath of the war were the United States, Canada, and Argentina. Interesting. Yeah. 
Okay, Betty. Betty says um, the ordeals of this family remind me uh, remind me of one of uh, Nietzsche's aphorisms: "What doesn't kill you makes you stronger." Was this in your mind when writing this story uh, about this German ancestored family? Uh, certainly, because just looking at the arc of their lives, um, I have I have encountered few families. Uh, before or, and I imagine for a long time after, you know, studying the Martells that went through as much as they did and yet kept their resiliency, kept the ability to keep going. And they really did believe at the end of their lives that it was all, you know, set in motion that starving at one point allowed them to at least be hungry on the trek. And, and you know, everything that happened gave them the ability to be, for example, losing the child made her a more zealous mother, right? Because what could be worse to lose your first child and then to want to protect your other uh, uh, sons afterwards and yet get them to where the dream wants to be, which is freedom. They want to go a place where they're free to do what they want and live their own lives. Um, let's see, Angela, who, who's asking the question about Alberta, she says, I think there was a family in my hometown of Lamont. Um, yeah, many Ukrainians ended up there, apparently. Mm -hmm. Well, Alberta is, you know, is very much prairie or farm country in Canada, so yeah. it certainly would not be unusual for people who have yeah. been farming in the Ukraine to be looking for a similar kind of um, community and landscape to reboot. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Right. Okay. Damien asks, uh, how has how has working with James Patterson influenced the way you wrote Scarlet Sky and Green Valley? Um, I learned to take out the parts that were may have been interesting to me, but when I really thought about them, they weren't necessary for the book to function at its leanest. So that's a really sort of convoluted way of saying, I tried to leave the boring parts out. Yes, that's what he's it. taught me. He's very good at that. <clears throat> it's that really famous line, was it Elmore Leonard that said, I leave out the parts that readers skip? Um, yep. But you know yep. what, you did it. You do an interesting thing, which historical fiction is different than, yep. than a contemporary thriller. Historical fiction readers do like, you know, read detail and research and so forth. And you did a good job in the end by following up on the lives of those people as what the story ends. But then you did, you know, bookend after the preface, you bookend it sure. at the end by telling us. And I think sure. that's an important thing to do for people who read stories like this. You know, they, they want to know more rather right. than less. So while right. the book, the pacing of the book is important, you still have an opportunity to um, put in some of that detail. Of course, you always have a website too, you know, an author's website where you can stick all kinds of stuff that people who really care <laughs> can go and can go and look can at. Go and look at for sure. Yeah. And yeah, you know, that's you know that's the thing that that one of the things that also obviously attracted me to the Martell story is that it was a an epic adventure story, you know, yeah. and. That plays right into the whole my background as a thriller writer, because I was able to bring those stories and those scenes to life in a way that I might not have if I hadn't had that experience. Well, a thriller's a quest, basically. So, you know, it's that kind of storytelling. In fact, I would have said in answer to that question that I'm not sure you could have written these two books if you hadn't written your thrillers and possibly worked with Patterson. I mean, authors grow and develop, you know, they don't just come out of the womb writing of this sure. kind of a book. You've got to yeah. learn to handle your material, do your research, figure out the pacing, bring your characters to life. You know, and it's great to have a good editorial team. You have a very good publisher. I do. I have a great publisher. I love my team. Yeah. Oh, I'm impressed yeah. with them too. We do a lot of work together. And you know, yeah. I, I respect them for the terrific job they do with their authors, I think, bringing books to life. Patrick, yeah. anything else? Uh, yeah, Julia just came in the question. She says, um, Barbara's comment about this book not being crime fiction, but having all the elements of a suspense thriller novel is so true. 
How do you feel that your work as a journalist, uh, a crime fiction novelist, and a literary fiction novelist, as well as your time serving in the Peace Corps, inspired the way you approach your historical fiction? That's a great question. Um, that goes back all the way to Peace Corps. I was forced, I lived in Niger in West Africa. Um, I lived in a place called Agadez, which was on the ancient caravan route between Tripoli and Timbuktu. Uh, not many people can say that. Um, and uh, the experience really taught me the value of trying to understand another culture. And these, these kinds of stories forced me to understand another culture. That same theme carried through the way I, I worked as a journalist. I, when I did investigative work, I was always interested in trying to understand the culture of what was going on as a method of explaining what was going on, right? So the same thing to, to my mind holds true with writing historical fiction. You're trying to understand the culture of the people as it's functioning. And then what, what's happening when all that gets erupted and thrown into a crucible because that's really what happens here right they have a way of life even though it's been god awful for 20 years they still have a way of life and that's their culture and then bang it gets thrown in and it gets mixed so i'm thinking about that kind of thing all the time as i'm writing you know what's what's the evolution of the culture of the story right that this is taking place in contextually at the same time, I'm keeping the story in, in high gear. Um, so good question. That is, that goes right to the heart of the way I work. Do you have any, uh, any film or TV updates? Uh, we are, like everything, um, pre-production and production has been delayed because of COVID uh, with Beneath the Scarlet Sky, they have written a pilot. There is a seven hour Bible. They are trying to cast the general at the last that I heard. How about that? It's natural for a movie. I mean, if ever a novel was written for a movie, it's beneath the scarlet sky. Right. Yeah, well, even better, they're going to do seven hours, you know, in a limited television series. Oh, so, well, I should have said just film. Sorry, I didn't mean film. a movie, but Definitely. actually, I'm, I have almost abandoned movies for long form television and especially for book adaptations. You just can hardly do justice to a book in a in a movie. So especially one like that or one like this, yeah. um, you know, this is being read by a lot of people in Hollywood right now. Uh, I'm sure. Yeah very strong reaction from the people who, who've read it so far. Well, that's about it, Barbara. Um, All righty. Yeah. Well, Mark, it's been wonderful to catch up with you again. You know, over well. the years we've had any number of in-person events yeah. at the Poison Pen, and, um, and I hope we'll have another one when you get your next book written. But um, the magic of Zoom has allowed us to get together and, you know, talk about this excellent book, which actually publishes tomorrow, um, it does. I can't recommend enough. Uh, we will make, hold it up. A, we'll make a, oh, oh, I'll do it again. Right. Okay. Beneath nope. the scarlet sky and the last green valley. Um, there will be a podcast made of the audio from this. So I'll send Mark the, and his team the podcast link tomorrow. So feel free to recommend to your friends that they listen to the podcast and the video is going to live forever on our Facebook video page. So anybody who missed this is welcome to watch it. One of the most interesting things about doing this is not how many people are watching us right now. It's all the people who are going to watch this over the next week. You know, sure. Patrick and I are just astonished to watch, you know, the numbers jump. Um, and part of that is a function of whether you listeners who've been kind enough to join us tonight recommend it to your friends. But please do. Um, Mark, so great to see you. Thank you so much well, for sharing tonight with us. And Patrick, Thank you. massive job as always. Um, so good night, everybody. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your evening.